Are you looking for a modding tutorial? Well, you just found me. If you've ever visited the Don't Start Together modding forum, you might have seen me here and there, maybe you've seen my post about mob creation, or maybe you're the one that convinced me to make this video. Nevertheless, you want to create a mod for DST, and you need help. In this video, I'll talk about how to start working on a mod and the basics of mod, like the environment, useful files and tools. No custom items, mobs or world generation for now, so if you're hoping to see that, you're gonna have to wait a little longer, because I will make videos about those topics too. If you think you know all the basics, and you think you don't need to watch this video, know that you don't have a choice. Alright, let's move on to that. This should come as no surprise to anyone, but we can't just create a PNG and put it in a mod and expect the game to know how to use it. That's why we're gonna need tools to help us compile and, in some cases, decompile game assets. For viewing and extracting textures from the game, we're gonna be using text tools. For extracting animation files, we're gonna need K-tools. For uploading our mod to the workshop as well as compile our textures and animations, we'll need Don't Start Mod Tools and its autocompiler. And for creating our own animations, we'll need... Spriter. Links to all of those will be in the description. Don't Start Mod Tools are on Steam, and you can download them like any other game. Select tools in this little dropbox to make it easier to find. Now, unless you want to write your code using the node like a caveman, we're gonna need a proper source code editor. I, myself, am using Visual Studio Code, and I would highly suggest you also use it. However, if that's too much of a hassle, you can also use Notepad++ or Sublime, which comes nicely packaged with the mod tools we've downloaded previously. I'm gonna be using Visual Studio Code in this tutorial moving forward. For anyone who is also using Visual Studio Code, I recommend the Emi Lua extension for writing Lua source code. It's pretty cool, when it works. And that's it. While we're not gonna be using these programs today, in the future they will be very necessary. For now, you better prepare your notebooks because we're going to be diving into the code. Starting a mod in Don't Start Together is incredibly easy, even a 6 year old with a somewhat basic understanding of computers could do it. All you need to do is create a folder inside the mods folder. You can find it by going to wherever you install Steam, Steam Apps, Common, Don't Step Together, and Mods. Or directly through Steam. Right click Don't Step Together, click Properties, and Install Files. Here you can click Browse. It will take you to where the game files are located. And there you go. Every folder in here counts as a separate mod. You don't need to configure anything or download any libraries. Opening the game, if you go into the Mods section, you can already see your mod here. Before we start adding anything to this folder, let's talk a bit about how the game loads and runs mods. And I promise you it's not as boring as it sounds. Mods are loaded by the Mod Wrangler or Mod Manager. They can be loaded either as a client-sided mod on the main screen or as a server-sided mod on world creation. The game loops through every enabled mod and creates an environment for each one. It then sorts the mods based on their priority and runs two files. Mod Origin main.lua and Mod main.lua in that order. There is also one less known file that's also run called mod server creation main .lua. that's a mouthful, but I genuinely have never seen anyone use it, not even create themselves. Generally, you can put anything in these files, however, you might run into some problems if you don't understand how these files operate. Mod server creation main .lua is run only on the server, doesn't matter if your mod is clean inside it or not. It's run instantly after enabling the mod and before mod origin main .lua. It has a slightly different environment than the other two. Mod world gen main is run on the client as well as on the server. It can run instantly after enabling the mod on the client side. Mod main.lua is always run last and can run on the client and on the server. But unlike mod world gen main, it can run immediately after enabling, you need to apply the mod. These properties make different files work better for different scenarios. Mod main is the main file that most people write most of their code in. Mod world gen main is most useful for world generation, as the name would suggest. Mod server creation main is not very useful, however it does have a different environment and runs immediately after enabling the mod. So maybe someone could use that for something interesting. I don't know. Let's talk about the environment. No, not this environment. True programmers don't go outside. The modding environment. For a mod to have access to different global functions, variables or objects, mod main.lua needs to be run inside a special environment. Let's check this create environment function. You can see the base structure of the environment your mod runs in. We have pairs, i pairs, print, math, require, class. These are all categorized as Lua. Below that we have tuning, 
Blood Brothers Vorgen, and at the very bottom Utility. The most important environment variables are the ones categorized as Lua, and the global table. This is the base environment table, however below we can see that more values are added to the environment itself, which is saved as env and mod import, which is called crazy loader. In another file called modutil.lua, inside the insert post init functions function, utility functions are added. You can see there's plenty of them, and most of them are used for overwriting stuff, changing what's already in the game. Let's go back to global for a bit. As you can see, it saves the underscore g table. In Lua, underscore g is the name of the table that holds every global function available with the clap, anything that does not start with the local keyword. In this case, underscore g would be the global scope of the base game, so anything that has been declared as global by the game. A good example I can give is the strings table, which is a giant table that holds anything from character codes to recipe descriptions. Strings is not passed into the mod environment, but we can access it through the global table by simply indexing it. So anything declared globally by the game can be accessed by mods through this table. A neat trick I discovered not too long ago is that you can manipulate your environment using the setPenf function. For example, I don't like using the global word inside my code because, I mean, just look. The very first two lines of my mod main start with this, basically allowing me to use the underscore g instead of global. Makes my code look cleaner and more readable. So now that you understand how mods run, it should be pretty obvious what to do now. Back in our folder, we're gonna create the mod main Lua file. Inside, we'll write a simple print command. Before we can actually test it though, we'll need to create one more file called modinfo.lua. This file is used to declare certain information that needs to be provided if one is to upload their mod to the workshop. Inside, this is what we'll write. I feel like most of these values should be pretty self-explanatory, but in case you're not sure. Name. This is the name that's visible inside the game in the mod screen. Doesn't need to be the same as the name on the workshop. Description. This is the mod description. It is also not the same as the description on the workshop. The author. Also visible in the game's mod screen, and also not the same as the workshop author. Version. This is the version that shows up on the workshop. And there's a little catch with this one. Whenever you update your mod using the mod tools, you need to specify a different, not bigger, just different, version string than the version that's currently on the workshop. So if you have a published mod with let's say version 1.5.1, if you want to update this mod, you will have to change this value to anything other than 1.5.1. Form thread is a string with a URL. This URL is open when you click this button in the mod screen. Icon Atlas and Icon are two string values for the icon that shows up in the game for your mod. Client only mod makes your mod client only, so only you need to have it downloaded to use it when you're playing on a server. Client only mods cannot interact with anything that's not client sided. All clients require a mod. Makes your mod server sided, basically forcing anyone playing with you to also have that mod installed. Client only mod and all clients require mod are mutually exclusive. DST compatible, Reign of Giants compatible, and Don't Starve compatible are simple compatibility flags to let the game and the players know what games or DLCs your mod is compatible with. Priority. This one is used for deciding in what order mods should be loaded in. The lower the priority, the further back in the queue your mod is. So a mod with priority 1 will be loaded before any mod with a lower priority. It is possible for two different mods to have the same priority, in this case the names of the mods are compared. API version. Simple integer value that needs to be kept up to date with the game. Current API version can be seen in mods.lua at the very start of the file. Configuration options is a table of configurations for your mod. Having any configs here unlocks this button. I'll talk more about configurations in a different video. This is what an average mod info looks like. With these two files ready, we can now open the game, create a new world, enable our mod, and behold! Well, we haven't really done anything eye-catching yet, but you might remember we wrote a print function in the mod main earlier. Where is it? In the logs, of course. Going into your documents, there should be a folder called clay. Inside, click do not start together. And here you can find a few log files. The three we're most interested in are client log, master server log, and case server log. Let's go ahead and open them all in our editor. If you're using Visual Studio Code, you can click Ctrl F to open word search. It should also work in Notepad++ and Sublime. Write hello constant. And as you can see, it did in fact print in every one of these files. Keep this free in mind when you're debugging your mods. You will need them. 
While we're at the topic of debugging, I think it's necessary to mention the command console. You can open it by pressing the tilde key in game. If for some reason it doesn't open, you probably don't have it enabled. You can enable it by going into the donut stuff together folder and then click on the folder with numbers. Inside you need to open clean.ini. Here set console enabled to true and save. Be sure to restart your game. Any command you input here can be run either on the server or on the client. Toggle by pressing control. There's plenty of commands that you can use that can help you debug your mod. Some of the more useful ones are cspawn, which spawns entities under your cursor, cgive, which creates entities and places them in your inventory, creset, which resets your world, and csave, which saves it. And now you know the basics. Now you understand your environment. Eh? Eh? <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching the video. I hope you liked it and that it wasn't too unbearable to listen to. My English pronunciation is not that great yet. If you have a spare minute, I'd love to hear some feedback on the editing and the whole structure of the video. Also, if I made any mistakes or you want to suggest a topic for me to cover, tell me in the comments. As I said at the start, this video is only an introduction, so it feels a bit directionless, and if you were just looking for a quick guide on a certain topic, this probably wasn't it. But in the next video, which hopefully won't take two weeks to record, we'll talk about prefabs, inventory items, and useful components for said items. For now, I highly suggest you check out the modding forums, link in the description, plenty of guides for you there, but if you'd rather wait for that items video, why not subscribe? Only a small percentage of people.